John, cheers for your time. It's great that I can actually share some experiences from someone that's that's invested in technology, but not necessarily running a technical role. Um, and I think that's one of the things I want everyone to understand is that the technology industry isn't just full of technical people, right? And I think it's going to be really interesting to hear about how your career's progressed and the pivots and changes you've made over the years, the highs and the lows, and hopefully we can give someone to give something to someone to take away. And um, so as a starting point, we just have an intro to who you are, what you do. Uh, that'd be great. Yep. So my name's uh, Jonathan Valdez. I'm sales director for CDW. I'm particularly focused on our international business. So that's um, assisting our large multinational organizations that are headquartered out of the UK or US and working with them to um, support them, consolidate the supply chain from a services and a technology perspective uh, on a global basis. Perfect. And so, so how did you get into this, this career? Right? How did you start out and how has it progressed to today? Yeah, so, so that's an interesting question. And um, so I think I've, I've always loved technology. And I think that's driven very much from a love of, um, you know, science fiction and, uh, you know, consumer gadgetry. So I think there's always an aspect to that. I definitely um, love talking to people, working with people. Um, but ultimately, I fell into this role. And I think that is so true for so many people that um, work in sales that, you know, un unless you're a rare minority, actually, you, you, you don't, you don't, you know, leave university with a burning desire to go into sales, it, it's very often a stopgap. And I think it was the same with me that, you know, actually, what I wanted to do is run my own business. I had loads of harebrain businesses and schemes uh, that, that, that I was invested in and, and, and what have you. And, you know, working in, uh, for an IT reseller was, was just a, a stopgap. Um, but actually, when I um, started doing the role, I realised how varied it was, how interesting it was. Um, and um, it really developed from there. Um, and, and I built an interest from there. So um, as, um, uh, as most sales leadership start out, I started as, a, as an account manager. Um, I did that for, uh, for a number of years, um, worked my way up. Um, from that, became a team leader. From a team leader, became a sales manager, managing uh, a team of account managers. And from that, became a sales director, um, managing a team of managers um, who in turn managed their the respective teams. So, Yeah, I know on that journey as well, you, you, you've just come back to the UK, right? So you've you've had some time away from the country and then you've had a whole new experience in, in across the pond. We could get an overview of that. How, how was that and, and what did that kind of look like? Yeah, so I think, um, so I, I was very, very fortunate in the sense that I got the opportunity to work in the States. And I think um, personally, uh, myself and my wife, we've always wanted to, to live and work in the States. You know, we've always had uh, a fascination with uh, America and the, the culture and the landscapes and, and the cities. And, uh, you know, we, we always had that objective of, of working in the States. And um, fortunately, with the CDW acquisition of uh, Kelway, that became a possibility. So in 2015, when CDW bought Kelway, uh, I had the opportunity to relocate myself and my family over to head office in, in Chicago, Illinois. Um, and there I was sales director for the, for the West Coast of America, which was primarily looking after um, our customers in the Silicon Valley area. So um, all of the usual suspects, the LinkedIn and the Airbnbs and, and, and Uber and, and, and what have you. And I think, you know, that was su such an incredible experience for a whole host of uh, reasons. And I think, firstly, I would encourage anybody to, to um, relocate and work in a, you know, a, a foreign environment, a, a foreign culture. And I think, you know, there were so many lessons that um, we, we drew from that, um, both on a sort of a professional perspective. You know, Silicon Valley is a very um, uh, different um, place to what I'd ever imagined. Um, and, uh, you, you, you know, I remember uh, certainly in the UK dealing with, you know, law firms, construction, um, a, a little bit in technology. But I remember day one on the job in, um, in, uh, in CDW US, 
I, uh, I went to dinner with, I think, the head of uh, IT, the, uh, the CIO, in fact, for Uber. And I remember sitting down with her and, you know, as you do, making a bit of small talk. And, you know, I asked her about business and I asked her about, you know, so, so what projects are you working on at the moment? And uh, she started telling me about, obviously, uh, self-driving cars, her, you know, um, her uh, Uber drones to carry people from uh, A to B, how they're piloting um, Uber helicopters in, in, in certain environments. And, you know, it absolutely just blew my mind. Um, so, you know, incredible from a professional perspective. And then also from a personal perspective, I think it really sort of tests you and sets uh, uh, your, your perspective as to, you know, what's important in your career, what's important in life. So, yeah, absolutely fantastic um, opportunity. Um, and now back in the UK, managing our international uh, business, it's given me some great insights into how, how business is done. And, and, and actually some of, you know, uh, America is by far, our, our, I think, our, our, our closest cultural trading partner. But, you know, there is still, you know, significant cultural differences there. Um, so some great insights for sure. Yeah, perfect. <clears throat> so if we think about the day in the life of John Valdez, right? So what, what does the role of a sales leader look like? What, what, did, what do you get up to? Yeah, so I think it's, it's incredibly varied. And I, and I think that's one of the things that um, really attracts me to the role. So, um, you know, on one day, I could be very much focused on customer meetings. Um, and I could be meeting with a huge um, range of different contacts from, from a, a different set of industries. Um, often talking about the business priorities, the, the challenges that they're uh, faced with, key initiatives that they're looking to roll out in, in, in the next 12 months, the, these type of conversations. So very interesting, very challenging. Um, I could be doing that one day and uh, the next day um, I could be um, uh, presenting to our partner summit, which was something that I was doing earlier today. Um, I could be working on a training and development plan with our, our managers, um, working with the accountants um, and uh, people in FBNA on you know business strategy. I could be working on. Um, I do a lot with our international locations, um, both from a, a managing personnel out there, but also you know working on the strategy for those uh, individual locations. So you know again that could be something that I'm working on. So yeah, re really uh, varied um, sort of uh, role. Very exciting. Yeah, what would you say? Do you, do you miss the buzz of being an account manager, chasing down the deals? Um, actually, yes and no. I think that um, you know, there's no, there's no, um, uh, no archetype typical sales director. Um, but I think that um, I, I very much like to be involved with customers directly, um, and I, I, I would probably argue that I get to do a lot of the fun stuff. Um, you know, those really interesting conversations and often, you know, working with customers at a high level to, you know, interpret some of their business objectives into, you know, a, maybe a process or, 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 a, or a technology set um, that, can, that, that can turn those business objectives into reality. I get to, you know, have a lot of those really exciting um, conversations without um, perhaps a, a degree of the, the drudgery. So, yeah, I, I still very much enjoy that. Uh, that that customer contact. So um, so yes, no. I, I sort of um, uh, you know I think this is misconception, isn't there, in, in, in management? And I think you'll know that that, uh, that it's somehow uh, more money, um, less responsibility, less stress. And and I can tell you, it is the exact opposite of those three things. So you know, perhaps that's that there's some of the things that I envy. Yeah, well, I can 100% agree with that one for sure. Um, <laughs> So if you think about the, some of the most memorable moments, right? what is the most memorable moment for you in, in your career today? Yeah, I think that has been a lot. So I was fortunate enough to join Kelway when it was essentially in startup mode. So I think we had, you know, some 20 people working for us. We were probably turning over about 20 million revenue per year. And uh, we were very much in startup mode. Um, and lacked a lot of the um, uh, professional capabilities that, that we do now. And um, 
I think year on year, we've had to add to our proposition. We've grown in capability and size and professionalism. Um, we've acquired businesses. I believe uh, uh, we've acquired uh, seven or eight businesses um, over the 20 years that I've been here. Um, and and, and it's, it's felt like a, a different role almost every, you know, two, two to three years. So, you know, in that time, there's, there's been a lot of incredibly fun memories and it's very difficult to pick out, you know, one memory that stands out. I think in, in, in particular, I, I really love the early days when, you know, it felt like we were a family, you know, that, you know, on a Friday afternoon, um, we went to the pub. I want to say we went to the pub. Every single person in the business went to the pub and we talked about the week and we shared experiences and talked about what people were working on. And there was, you just had that lovely um, feeling of, you know, perhaps some chance encounters. So, you know, I would sit down with, you know, as an account manager, I would sit down with the head of procurement and, and I would spend, you know, an hour talking to the head of procurement about her role and stuff like that. Something that, you know, you don't always get the opportunity to do uh, in, in, in a large um, organisation. And we still have that family, you know, feel and family environment. But I think it, it exists far more in the departments and the teams than necessarily as a, as a, as a broader organisation. So, you know, some very fond memories attached to that. Um, as particularly as being um, in, in the international side of the business, um, uh, you know, there's a requirement to travel. You know, I've, we've had some great experiences um, from a travel perspective. There's been, you know, some great incentives and vendor trips and seminars and, and things like that that, um, you know, really stay with me. Um, some of the characters um, that, that we've had, you know, um, that we still have, you know, we've created some great memories and, you know, seeing some of our, you know, academy people enter the business, you know, straight out of university, um, where, where this is their first real job and very, very little experience about what's expected of them. Um, and seeing them grow day by day, you know, week by week to become some of the top account managers in the entire business. You know, I mean, that is incredibly rewarding and, uh, you know, fantastic to, to witness. And, you know, particularly at CDW, actually, our, our top um, uh, account manager in the entire business is, is, is a gentleman that um, started the business five years ago, straight out of university and went through our academy program. I mean, what a, what a fantastic uh, achievement. Perfect. And would you say there's been, obviously along the way, there's always little mistakes that happen. Uh, everyone makes mistakes, right? But is, is there any like, like mistakes that you can mention that are ones that you learn a good lesson from that you would distill onto your team or into people watching this video? Yeah, so it's, it's, it's funny. Um, so uh, one of my managers um, that works for me um, always says that um, good people um, learn from their mistakes and great people learn from others' mistakes. I'm definitely not a great person <laughs> and I have plenty of scars on my back and mistakes that I've made without a shadow of a doubt. And I think, you know, in some respects, um, that, is the, that is the best way to learn, to, to go out there, to fall, to pick yourself up, to, to do the wrong thing. Um, and, uh, you, you know, I, particularly to my managers, I talk a lot about, you know, the importance of developing some some scars on, on your back and I also think that you know it is so important that you create a culture where it's okay to fail it's okay to take risks and get it wrong as long as you learn from that yeah um, and I think so often we see some of the mistakes particularly of some of our larger um organizations in the industry where they become so incredibly risk adverse that they're unwilling to, to take risks. And I think very often that is their downfall. And very often I think that actually, um, you know, it's better to make a decision to take a risk, to get it wrong than to make no decision at all. Yeah, definitely. And I firmly believe that. So I, and I think to, to, answer, to answer it personally, I guess um, there's, pro, you know, I'd, I'd say, in general, I would say the mistakes that I made in my early career probably still haunt me to a certain extent. And I think they all stem from an absolute, a 
incredibly aggressive competitive streak that I have in me and, and, and a competitive streak where I had to win at all costs and I had to win every argument no matter um, how trivial or how important it may be and I think as I've got a bit older and, and got a few more scars on my back I've realized that actually it is very important to pick your battles and you don't need to win every argument and actually it really is a long game and sometimes you know you, you have to admit you're wrong even when you're right just to move forward um so i think you know that perhaps they're the the, the biggest mistakes that i've made is, is probably stems from that you know ultra competitive nature and you know perhaps uh, if i could go back I'd, I'd, I'd probably mellow that out somewhat yeah and do you think you've made any sacrifices along the way I think the sacrifices that I've made are, are probably fairly standard and I'm sure fairly, you know, would be no different to yourself. Um, I think that I have in my, and, and very common, you know, I think in the, in the early days, I think I definitely sacrificed probably my health, you know, either working too hard or, you know, and um, in, in, as an account manager, there's quite an emphasis on, you know, and, or as a manager, quite an emphasis on team relationships, on relationships with vendors, with customers. So there's quite a large degree of um, uh, entertaining um, and, and, and then working late. So I think particularly in the early part of my career, um, you know, I think I uh, made some sacrifices on, on my health. Um, you know, lack of sleep, um, you know, poor diet. Uh, I, I think I'm definitely making making it up. Um, and then, you know, I, I guess equally, you know, with, with my family, I think and then it's not only the issue that um, I was often away from, from home, I was often working late into the evening. Um, it was also about the time that I spent with my family, you know, making sure that I was properly engaged, um, yeah. And so, yeah, I, I think those sacrifices uh, I've, I've made, but yeah, yeah luckily making up for it now. <laughs> yeah, that's that's the key thing, right, is making up for it. So, but happy wife, happy life and all uh, that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, if you think like looking back at yourself and when you were starting out or when you've pivoted in your career, what, what top three tips would you give yourself now looking back? Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll try and give you three tips. I'll, I'll see if I can keep it to three. Um, <laughs> I think that, so ultimately, and I think I, I said to you at the start, you know, we, we work in technology. I love technology. I love it at a business level. I love it at a consumer level. Uh, absolute geek at heart, born from a love of science fiction and, 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 and what have you. But, but ultimately, the, you know, I, I work as part of the sales organization. You know, I, I, I represent sales. And I think that particularly in the UK, sales is um looked down on it's not considered a career um you know there's a certain stigma i, I feel to, to being a salesperson particularly in the uk i think interestingly that's not the case in the us um i think that it is respected as a respectable career um they even have university degrees for sales um, and, and certainly aspects of degrees um, which, which are in sales. So I think that I'd probably um, give myself the advice that sales is a perfectly respectable um, profession to, to be in, um, and, uh, and it is a career in its own right. Um, and, I, and I would certainly give that uh, advice to anybody who's you know, considering a move into sales. Um, I think that you know, some, some other perhaps mantras that I think are very important to me and, and, and I've seen them play out again and again and again and again. And, you know, this is probably the point where, you know, I, I sound a little bit like a cliche, but I, I firmly believe it's not how good you are. It's not how inherent, inherently gifted you may be or what your background is. It's not how good you are, it's how bad you want it. Yeah. And so, you know, it's so important that people aren't, you know, when they're entering a, a new organization, uh, particularly if they have less experience than the people around them, that, that, that they look around them and, and they understand that these people are absolutely, they may be performing at a higher level. 
They may have a lot more experience, a lot more understanding than they do, but fundamentally, they are no better than anybody else. And the only thing that separates them, maybe is a little bit of experience, but you can go out and get that, um, is, is the drive and the determination to learn, to develop, to get knocked down, to pick themselves up. So, you know, I, I really, and I see that play out time and time and time again and particularly we see that in our academy program and our graduate program you know we see people um come into the program that um may, maybe are um are slightly uh, entitled maybe have um are um are, are particularly articulate maybe they are particularly extrovert and I think there's a common misconception that to be good in sales, you have to be an extrovert. I think actually at our level, I think it's quite the reverse, you know, good listening skills, problem solving skills, far more important than the ability to talk. And, and we see that in the academy where, you know, perhaps somebody is an extrovert with a, a very good ability to talk is overtaken by that person that just has that ability to listen and, and work and work and work so yeah it's not how good you are um it, it's, it's, it's how bad you want it um on that, everything about some of the um so, some of the people that i know i've worked with in see them in other other resources i've worked at what i've seen more and more common over the last maybe two three four years is is the buddy system right of the introvert and the extrovert having that the showman salesperson at the front doing the cold calling, taking the knockbacks, getting the, the disappointing nose all the time, right? And then having the, the introvert guy at the back doing the run rate, the getting things done activity in the background, the less kind of relationship building activities and just being the kind of the person that's needed to make sure that customer gets what they want on the Monday morning for 9 a.m. Um, I think that buddy system is something I've seen work considerably well over the last few years for, yep. for people of different types of sales mentality. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I think it's all about, you know, having complementary skills. I think that equally no two customers are the same in, in you know, their setup, their processes, the, the individuals. And I think it's just so important that any sales organization has the ability to, to flex and pivot um, based on based on customer requirements. And I think that, you, you, you know, this this whole idea of hunter, farmer type mentality you know i'm not entirely comfortable with to be honest because i think that you know i just don't see a i don't see any customers that are content with a farmer mentality in their account manager somebody who's going to sit there quote something wait for an order to come in get the order and then ship that out make sure the lead time you know all of that is um, you know, exceptional price, good response times, great customer service. Don't get me wrong, that's incredibly important. But I do think that so much of that is a given nowadays. Mm -hmm. And I actually think that, you know, in addition to that, it's vital that um, their account managers are, are challenging their customers. Hey, have you have you looked at this new technology? I'm conscious that, that you've got these locations in this um, uh, in, in India and, and Singapore, tell me about the challenges that you face there. Are you aware that we can help you consolidate, rationalize not only the supply chain, but the, the technology choices that, you know, they're constantly challenging and bringing new ideas to, to, to customers. So, you know, I do agree with you. Um, I, I, I'm, I, I'm slightly uncomfortable uh, with it in the sense that I, I, I think no matter what the customer there's always that need to be constantly challenging the, the, the customer and, and evolving and, and, and adapting but i think that's the, the, the one of the biggest change i've seen in sales over the last 15 years of working in the channel is that is that mindset change from that hunter gatherer farming it and then not really asking those awkward questions right so why do you want that kind of scenario yeah. what are you using it for then also, can I have a copy of your business plan, your IT plan? I want to bring value to you rather than just being the guy sat there waiting for the order. I think that's something that this, over the last, definitely over the last three, four years has been a lot more prevalent, especially within where we work, right? Where our customers are expecting us to, to, to challenge the norm and to bring value to them day to day. Honestly, I think that's so true. I mean, I've seen, I, I mean, it's self-evident um, the the change and the disruption and, and, and how fast paced that, that rate of change is in, 
in, in technology, you know, I think what often goes um, overlooked is the change within the sales industry. And I, and I just remember when I started in, you know, sales, it, 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 you know, it was very much focused on relationship selling, building rapport, you know, being somebody's friends, having common grounds, you know, that, that type of stuff. And it was very much focused on regurgitating a list of USPs and benefits, you know, open questions and, you know, um, uh, cold calls and, uh, you know, all, all, all of this uh, type of thing. And, uh, you know, I don't, I think there'll always be a place for, for that in, in, in moderation. Um, however, I think things have moved on, you know, so much. I think that, you know, customers don't want to hear about USPs and, and benefits so often, you know, your USP, your value add is actually the way that you engage your customers. Um, so yeah, and it's a huge uh, change around that. And I think there's, there's definitely, I think we've got a way to go, but I, I definitely have seen sort of a, a you know, far more professionalism uh, and, and enter the um, sales environment for sure. Yeah, yeah definitely. It's good to and see. If we think about like the, the time for your career, right? Has there ever been a moment where, I'm fairly sure this will happen right from that startup mentality to, to where we are today, but where you've got to a point and you thought, right, I'm done, I'm quitting, this is it. Yeah. <laughs> and then you've gone, actually, no, I'm going to fight through that barrier and, and resolve yeah. it, right? Is it any of those that you could maybe reference and talk us through? Yeah, I'm, you know, absolutely. You know, the, there, have, there have been times, and I, and I think, you know, this is perhaps some of the advice I'd give to myself if I was starting over again, you know, unless you're incredibly lucky, you know, you will not enjoy every single aspect of your role. There will be some part of your role that will grind you down, that will be mundane, that whatever, you know, that there'll, there'll be some, some parts of your job that you dislike. And, and, and I think very often, you know, if you focus too much on those parts of your job that you, you dislike, I think it can really change your whole perception of the role um, instead of, you know, taking a, taking a view where you're looking to minimize the impact of uh, perhaps those negatives. So I think, you, you know, if I look at perhaps the times that I've been, uh, I've looked to perhaps resign and, and there have been some, um, I think that um, it, it's really twofold. I think um, when I've, um, you know, going, and going back to what I was saying before, maybe compromised on my health, you know, worked too hard, um, uh, felt burnt out, um, been overwhelmed, by stress, concentrated too much on the negative things and, and, and felt somewhat overwhelmed. And I think I have been at the point of, you know, quitting at, 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 at those points. And I think, you know, also uh, potentially, you know, where, where I think where I've let my ego get in the way where, you know, again, you know, having that mentality where, where I, you know, just cannot lose uh, at any cost. Um, and when decisions do go against me, you know, I'm, I, I felt backed into a corner and I think, you know, wrongly, um, my ego has, has got in the way. And I think actually it's those, those incredibly uncomfortable moments where I've had to, you know, be, be magnanimous in defeat and realize that, you know, it's not all about, you know, whether or not I win or lose, um, but actually I've, I've sort of grown from, from the most, actually far more than, you know, when things have gone right and in, in my favor. So, yeah. I think um, I can, I can kind of relate to that to a degree. I think from I've been very lucky. There's been a few times in my career where I kind of sat there and gone, right, I'm I'm done, right. And yeah. the reasons generally for me have generally come down to um, feeling 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 alone, probably, right, mm -hmm. being a bit at an edge. So as a consultant over the years, you're on your own a lot, traveling all over the country. You'll be in hotel rooms every night. You'll be on the customer site for 14 hours a day, and then you'll be back in your hotel room again. And I did that for many years, right. And there's there was one project I was on for for two years doing that Monday to Friday and you don't get family time you don't, and look back then I didn't have a wife and a child so it wasn't too different for me it was more around my my seeing my mum and dad and things right and seeing my friends and socializing and living the life of uh, of youth and um when I look back at that now I was like the, I remember quitting one job purely because that I, I wanted to go out with my friends <laughs> right yeah, yeah. and and Looking back, was that the right move? Um, honestly, yes, I think it was. I think I was getting the, the, the Michael taken out of me a little bit with all the uh, expectation. But actually, was that an expectation the business was setting on me? Was that an expectation I was setting of myself because I wanted to progress? Um, 
and, and looking back at it, they're the kind of things like emotionally, I think, as you are when you're a lot younger, that you you jump to the first emotion you get given and then you run with that until it goes into the flames. Oh, 100% agree. Yeah, I, I mean, people do some, some strange things when it, emotions are running high. But it's interesting that you talk about loneliness because I do think there is an element of that um, when you're a manager in the sense that, you know, I believe that good managers, it, it, it's their team first, and then and then them you know the, the the primary objective is to support their team first and foremost yeah. be it um through uh customer support through dealing with escalations through sim simply getting together in a room with a sole purpose of driving the business forward you know looking at the strategy and the tactics um involved now you know being that sort of servant leader of sorts i don't think that means that you don't challenge your your team that you don't tell them when they're doing things wrong but i think that if you take that approach it can it can be very isolating and you can you can very much feel on your own which is why i think it's so important that you know you, you work with your peers to share frustration and share ideas and, and stuff yeah. like that but, yeah. i think as a manager that's, that's that's how we're able to build that ecosystem of trust within the team as they feel that they can do that but then also talking back to the thing you mentioned earlier on um managing risk right and we want people to take risk and we want people to to fail and learn from those mistakes because that's the only way you really learn i think as a manager as well your role is to to spot when those mistakes are are minimal and non-impactful and then when there's the bigger high risk things you can see going just monitoring before it becomes a blip to a to a massive issue you can then step in and maybe nurse it back down to staying as a blip potentially i think that's a, a big challenge and it's a skill that, that i'd never really really thought about being a technical person and not a manager in the past and then being on this leadership and management course talking about these things kind of makes you think well actually it's a it's a whole new skill that that's a mixture of soft skills and, and an educational skill that you get taught and it's something that it's going to take a while to, to definitely not necessarily master but learn. Yeah, I think, um, you know, that is definitely a skill that, you know, there are times when you have to step in and say, I know you want to do it like this, but actually it's not going to work and we need to look at it in a different way. You know, there are absolutely times when, when you need to do that. And, and I think particularly when people are in the early stages of their career um, and, and perhaps they, they lack the the experience and you know often manage management becomes far more nuanced i think when when you're dealing with more, more experienced people yeah um but then absolutely i think the preferred style has to be that one of coaching hey if you take this approach what do you think the outcome will be how do you think you could approve that what do you think you could do differently and i think you know once you've tried that once you try to influence them you know once, once you've tried you know the coaching approach if it really does look like a car crash then uh and and it, you know and it is impactful then yeah potentially that's where you uh ah oh, sorry it's not gonna happen <laughs> yeah i think that, that that coaching was probably using that that ted kind of approach like that tell me explain to me describe to me approach rather than the closed question stuff because i think that, that's the only way you're really going to get someone to have a realization that they could actually fix it themselves yeah yeah and and it's, it's funny isn't it um I mean, you get into this argument about, um, you know, whether or not, um, and I, I'm sure it, the same is in um, your world as well, whether or not good salespeople make good managers. And I bet you have exactly the same argument, whereas, you know, do good engineers make, make, make good managers? And, and um, you know, I, I think that in my experience, gen, you know, not always, but very often, you know, the good account managers do make good managers because they're very used to asking open questions mm -hmm. you know different questions questions that challenge and and listen and then work for um solutions and and and, and wait for um uh, and, and try and work on the solutions and, and use their powers of you know influence um to, to to come up with the right conclusion as opposed to much more of sort of uh, a, a dictatorial approach you will do this and you know which you know from my experience will only take you so far yeah definitely so if we move on to the industry right and we think about what's changed over the years that you've been in in this technology industry what do you think the biggest change has been so far you know it, it's, it's difficult to pick out one big change um you know you you could 
potentially put it down to a particular technology. You know, I think that iPhone has been pretty revolutionary. You could talk about cloud AI, um, something um, of, of that nature. Um, I think that they're the big sort of agents for change, I would say. Um, I would say outside of that, um, you, I think the change tends to be incremental in nature. That, mm -hmm. um, you know, if I look at, you know, the sales industry, you know, I look at, you know, 20 years ago when I, when I started in, in IT sales to where it is now, you know, it's absolutely a completely different role. However, there wasn't a big transformation it happened in in in, in little increments so I, I think that we see particularly in the reseller world uh where we see a um a, a drive toward a separation in the it industry if you like between um perhaps the large multinational organizations like cdw where perhaps the proposition becomes about scale international reach uh, the breadth of our offering, um, these um, type of things. Um, I think the industry is separated into, you know, these these huge IT resellers, and then perhaps more of the small boutique IT resellers that might have a really in-depth specialization on one key technology, but then not necessarily have the end-to-end the -end skills or the knowledge of other uh, te technologies in that area. So I think that, you know, we've really seen that um, over the recent uh, recent years. Um, I think we've definitely seen um, things like a, a change in the way that customers are buying in terms of much more of that lines of business approach um, where actually, uh, you know, the marketing director might have a far greater budget for IT than say, you know, the, the, the IT manager. That's certainly true in CDW and our organization, you know, our, our marketing department has a far bigger budget on IT than, you know, our IT operations uh, do. So, you know, definitely that line of uh, business approach. And then, you know, really, I, I guess the, um, uh, the, the consumption, the way customers are consuming much more of that opex style approach to, to to the capex style of approach and i think you know that's definitely happened probably in the past you know four or five years and i think some companies have really been ahead of the curve and really you know embraced that change and adapted to it uh, quickly i think other companies have really struggled in moving to that uh, you know an opex uh, position which may you know cannibalize their existing business um, and um, and obviously you need a huge array of sort of systems and and, and methodology behind that. So I think that they're sort of like the the major changes. I feel yeah, I think the biggest change for me from a from a technical side of the fence, right, and and how that then maybe engages with sales to an extent is is how IT has become less of a necessity to more of an enabler and a driver in a business. And every business now, whether you're a small MOT center through to a an automotive manufacturer, right? The technology is required to deliver any part of that business now. And yep. you might not have an IT guy on site, right? You might take everything as a service, but the idea is, is that without those technology fundamentals in place and the, the capability, you, you wouldn't have a business anymore. And I think that's the biggest change for me looking back is that rather than it just being, yeah, these are the guys that spend a hell of a lot of money on network and servers and phone systems and everything else, which is fantastic. But how is that actually giving business value whereas now the conversation more is around we want to enable this the first question is how can we now do that with technology instead yeah no i i could not agree more and you know uh, technologies like you know internet of things have really sort of you know uh, progressed that you know the technology is in absolutely everything all aspects of life and, and business and i think the, the one thing which is crazy um, to think about it now is the role of the cto did not exist, did not really exist when I joined in uh, IT. So this idea that, you know, you would have a representative from uh, the IT side that was a, a board member, you know, which was just alien, you know, uh, IT used to report into finance. Um, so yeah, the big, big shift there for sure. Yeah, definitely. And talking about shifts, well, we're currently in unprecedented times of the situation that's going on at the moment. And there's been positive and negative things that, have come, that I can see coming out of the back of this potentially. Is there anything that you'd like to comment on from a positive point of view rather than the negatives? Um, yeah, I think that um, 
it's made companies much more conscious about their employee well-being and I think those companies that will do well in this environment, um, well in the recovery, will be those companies that really put a focus on the well-being of their employees. Because generally speaking, happy staff are more productive staff um, and, um, and, and will be more bought into the, to the business long term, more likely to stay and, and be loyal to the, to the company. So I think we've definitely seen that trend. I, I know that there's a, a great weariness for Zoom meetings and, and WebEx. You know, I, I absolutely, I get that. But, and today is a great example from eight in the morning to, well now 6 p.m. I've been on back to back WebExes with only a 30 minute break for lunch and, and, and I'm, I'm exhausted. Um, so I get all that, but, actually the ability to have you know it's not the same as face to face but it's a good second best to be able to have that experience you know with multiple customers with multiple members of my team in in a single day is uh, is fantastic without you know having to get in a car drive across the country you know deal with the commute so although there's a lot of pressure and stress that comes in with you know video conferencing and, and and what have you I, I also think there's huge benefit and you know quite frankly the ability to to finish work at the normal time and then go down and, and eat dinner with my family is 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 just fantastic so that whole work-life balance I think we've realized that actually people working from home doesn't mean they're less productive in the main and yeah. depending on the industry so yeah. And I had a session with Bradley Wilkie, who you obviously know because he was at CW for a fair while, right? And he's already started uh, and funding into a VR company, right? And um, he sent me an Oculus Quest device, and we actually ran one of these sessions in a VR world that he created for us. So we did an interview in that kind of world. The concept that we were working on when we were talking about this was think about the, the, the social bit that we're missing, right? Is being able to get a group of people in a room and have different conversations on the go without having to go into breakout rooms, right? Because you can't hear the little bits that are going on. So imagine having a VR headset on with 3D sound so that you could walk slightly to the middle of the room and hear bits of every conversation and then go over to the conversation that you want and then walk over to the one. So it brings that kind of hub social mentality without leaving the, the realms of your, your room, right? And it's not, it's not fantastic. It's not a replacement for real social interaction, but in a, in a time where we can't interact with people, it's, it's far better than Zoom calls, in my opinion. <laughs> Um, I, I could not agree more. And I, and I think that is one of the technologies that I'm particularly excited about. Uh, and I think could be, you know, revolutionary. I, I don't think the technology is quite there yet. It's a bit clunky um, and uh, involves quite a lot of setup and, and, and stuff like that. But it's not far off and it's accelerating very, very quickly. You know, the fact that you can have a VR headset um, that isn't connected to anything and you can walk around uh, a room, the 3D sound where you can walk over to somebody and, and, and have a conversation, I think is fantastic. I think they, um, I, I love the idea of um, a VR um, trade show where you could you know walk to each stand have a look what you're interested in walk to the next stand and and then not have to get on a plane fly to another country um you know sit in a taxi for uh, for a while um i think that's that's very exciting i think that if they could get the price of the headsets down considerably where it could get to a point where you could send your team all the headsets and they were good quality headsets i think that that would be good and, and if they could do it so that you could drink a pint you know with, with the headset i think that you know i think it would I be think a game pubs to be all over that right i think in the current pandemic where the <laughs> local pubs are struggling i think that's that's going to be the game changer for them if that came along <laughs> it's not the same if you're drinking it through a straw but not at all no <laughs> helmets that you can put on with the drink yeah. inside. um so let's, let's go on to a lightning round right so um quick short snappy answers uh last technology purchase um, very boring, uh, an external hard drive. Yeah, okay. What's next? Purchase? Next purchase I'm looking to buy, which I'm very excited about. Um, and on the subject of AR and demonstrating what a complete geek I am is, uh, FPV, um, racing drone where you, you put on the uh, headset and you're like in the, in the drone, but yeah, Ooh. probably shouldn't admit to that in public, but yeah. <laughs> uh, who's your biggest inspiration? Oh gosh, 
Um, yeah, probably some family, some of my, my family in, in, in general, sort of key role models within my family that perhaps have um, inspired me to think about work in the way that I do, that have given me a love for travel, for technology. Um, so yeah, I would, I would say probably not the answer you're looking for, but I, I would say, you know, my, my, uh, my, my family. Yeah. I think everyone says that statistics are made up, right? So this is a definite made up statistic, but at least 80% of the people that I've interviewed so far have said family. <laughs> no way, really? Ah, uh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay, it's probably very, very boring and, and not what you uh, wanted to hear, but yeah. No, no, perfect. What does work-life balance mean to you? It means having dinner with my family every day. Yeah, good answer. Uh, what did you want to do when you finished school? I wanted to be a writer. Really? Okay. Absolutely, yeah. Ah, fiction? <laughs> fiction? Yeah, yeah, fiction. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, so, yeah, um, so, yeah, a bit, uh, bit of a bookworm. So, yeah, I wanted to be a writer. So it's um, been handy when I was writing RFPs, um, but other than that, it's been completely useless. <laughs> so, uh, what's your favourite book? Um, I have a favourite business book and I have a favourite personal book um and, and i think that the interesting thing about um business books is i think that um you know i put them in the same category as like maybe self-help books yeah. in a sense that there is some amazing you know self-help books and amazing business books um but i'd say that's probably the top five percent and the, and the other 95 percent are, are are garbage but um but i um and and you know potentially a huge book is written where you know an essay or an online blog would have done, would have done. <laughs> but i think um and it might be quite controversial, but I really like From Good to Great by Jim Collins. And the reason I like From, from Good to Great is um, it, it re when I read it, it very much resonated um, with the company challenges that we had, you know, going from a probably a great company, a really good company, and then maintaining that greatness into the second stage of of, of the evolution. So it hit me at a very interesting time. I think it was very insightful that where it was talking about, you know, actually great leaders are, are not necessarily these big, you know, Elon Musk type characters, you know, that actually the, the uh, people that, um, that, that listen, that are considerate, that are down to earth and can connect with, uh, with their staff. And, uh, and, and I think that really resonated for me. The reason I say it's controversial is Jim Collins analysed all these businesses that were absolutely great in the, in, in the fields compared to you know, other businesses in their vertical. And that was very much true at the time. Um, but I think looking back now, probably 60% of them have gone bust, if, if, if not more. <laughs> So, <laughs> so I think Kodak may have been in there. Yeah, yeah I remember seeing a, a slide deck where it shows you the change of the main brands over the last 20 years. Oh, yeah. And talking about the rate of change, I think on a, on a personal level, um, I like 100 Years of Solitude by Gabriel Garcia Marquez. That's my all time favorite uh, book and is about, um, uh, it is magic uh, realism. Um, so it's about um, the life of a, a, a village told over many, many, many gen generations. But oh, okay, hmm. yeah. that's I recommend that to anybody. But still, yeah, I'm getting definitely getting a list of books from these sessions. Um, but I am I, on a on a completely uh, um, complete tangent. I am uh, in the middle of Overstory by Richard Powers, um, which um, is an absolutely fantastic book um, about trees. And okay. I would I would just encourage everybody to go out and pick that book up. It's absolutely brilliant. Okay. Well, yeah, I, think, I never thought I'd hear a, a fantastic book about trees, but I'll, I'll have a look. And <laughs> Honestly, it's, it's <laughs> <laughs> uh, Most important thing to you? Uh, predictably, my family. Yeah. It's a default answer for everybody. I think everyone's yeah, afraid yeah, to say yeah. anything else. Just in case uh, my wife's <laughs> watching later, yeah. Uh, Favourite song? Um, I... Um, a closet doors. Uh, I, I love the doors. Um, so I'd probably have to say something like the end by uh, uh, but by the doors. But um, yeah, that's pretty pretty random. Cool. Uh, fill in the blank. The new normal is 
working from home. Yeah, must watch TV show. Um, oh, Game of Thrones, probably. Yeah, not, not bad. Not sense. bad show. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Oh, sorry. Favorite junk food. Favorite junk food, pizza, absolutely. Oh. Yeah, I think on that note, right, I think it's definitely time to go and grab some pizza or something. So thank yeah. you very much for your time, mate. It's been much appreciated. Cool, yeah, it's great. Anytime. <laughs>